tonight on CBC Vancouver News. So we are planning to be able to put vaccine into arms uh, and the first week of January. Operation Immunize, when you will likely be able to get vaccinated also. I can't say we were surprised, but yes, disappointed. On ice. Why BC has banned all adult team sports and the hunger outweighed the the harshness of my reality. This is wonderful, ladies. How the pandemic is putting pressure on local food banks. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening and thanks for joining us. There are signs tonight BC is beginning to beat back COVID-19 surge as the seven-day average of new cases is tailing off in some areas. However, with more cases comes more tragedy. Twelve more people dying from the virus, bringing our province's total to 481. There are 694 new cases of COVID-19 being reported. The total number of cases now more than 35,000. Active cases are also at a record high, now sitting at just over 9,100. And the number of people being monitored took a sharp increase from 10,200 to more than 10,800. Hospitalizations are down to 325. The number of patients in ICU is at 80. Fraser Health continues to account for the bulk of new cases, 67% since yesterday's update. Now, while Fraser Health's numbers remain high, of growing concern is the increase in cases outside the Lower Mainland. Vancouver's Coastal Health's active case count has seemingly leveled off, but for the rest of BC, the island, the interior, and northern health, the numbers continue to rise. A worrisome trend for communities with hospitals that aren't as well equipped to handle a larger COVID-19 surge. In all this, there is some light at the end of the tunnel. A vaccine for COVID-19, in fact, a couple of them, are on the horizon. And today, we got a better sense of when exactly we can expect immunizations to begin here in BC. Our Tina Lovegreen joins us now live in studio with more on that, Tina. Yeah, Mike, we heard some big news about vaccines today and when you can expect to get it. As we know, the first batch of vaccines will be limited as Canada is, is expecting six, six million doses for the first round. So the priority will be those in hospitals and seniors in long-term care homes. And Dr. Bonnie Henry revealed the timeline for when the first few will be administered and when it will be available for everyone else. What we're planning for, what we're, uh, all of our planning um, constructs is to be ready to start the first week of January and to hope to have everybody done by September of next year. So we, we expect there'll be a good lot of people who will be immunized by the summer um, and through the fall next year. But by the end of the year, anybody who wants vaccine in, in BC and in Canada should have, a, have it available to them and should be immunized. And we are expecting to learn more about BC's immunization rollout next week. So expect more details about how this will all unfold in the coming days. Yeah, people anxiously awaiting that for sure. And uh, we also learned uh, more today about those new restrictions for adult sports teams. What are they exactly and why? Yes, lots of talk about this online. And finally, some clarity. Indoor and outdoor adult sports are suspended. And we're talking about teams with players over the age of 19. We're talking basketball, hockey, soccer, curling, and a whole host of other sports. Now, the question is why? And Dr. Bonnie Henry says it's because 10 to 15% of infections are happening in these settings. And it's because of some of the socializing that's going on before and after the game. But we are seeing that team sports for adults in particular are ones where it's the before play or away from the field of play interactions that we're seeing most of the transmission. And you know, tennis is a good example where we've had quite large clusters related to uh, a tennis club, not the activity itself, but the um, ancillary activities around uh, playing tennis, for example. As for indoor and outdoor sports for youth and children, they're back to phase two, meaning only individual drills and modified training is allowed. All right, Tina Lovegreen with us live tonight. Thanks. And the expanded bans on adult sports teams have left many on the sidelines and 
Others wondering if they might be next. Zara Premji now on the frustrations athletes and businesses are feeling. Selma Mita is sporty most days, but she says the changes in public health orders in BC have made things frustrating. While her sport, pickleball, is one of the few ones that are left untouched by the province, she's not sure how long that will last and if she'll even know when it's suspended. From week to week, we don't know whether you know we're going to be allowed to go back in or stay out, and so we had to keep changing plans. While pickleball hasn't been sidelined, Mita says she thinks the entire province is sitting in constant confusion on what is and isn't allowed. She says it's rare to find a rec center that will offer her sport right now. Turn. As for the rest of the adult team sports outdoors and indoors. These poor hockey players, both male and female, um, are on the sidelines once again. Where they will remain and willingly. We've shut down right across the country now from Ontario out to BC, no, no game playing. We have laid off hundreds and hundreds of people. But they're asking for a favour from the province. I suggest we have to make it absolutely clear so everybody understands where they stand. So there has been confusion. These things take days to sort out after the, after the announcement. We're all constantly, you know, in a, in a state of just not knowing what to do. So if you're going to make a decision, just do it, tell us, and we're fine with that. But don't keep just two weeks and two weeks and two weeks. Dr. Henry says she's trying her best. I try to be very precise in the language I use. And sometimes in changing the legal language, some of the nuance gets um, lost or changed. So I think I just ask people to bear with me. The orders will remain in place until December 7th when the province will either change and or extend what's already in place. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. Port Alberni on Vancouver Island is quickly becoming a COVID hotspot tonight with exposure alerts at five schools and one hospital. West Coast General Hospital in Port Alberni as well as Saanich Peninsula Hospital are now affected. The outbreaks appear to be more widespread than first thought. Island Health says a total of two staff members and six patients have so far tested positive, with more cases discovered today. Exposure events have also shut down several restaurants in Port Alberni. Supports for BC's children with special needs have worsened during the second wave of the pandemic. A new report says the COVID-19 pandemic has amplified problems in a number of systems while layering on new ones as well. The representative for children and youth says gaps in long-term supports and delays getting assessments have persisted through the crisis. The report calls for immediate measures like extending pandemic-related benefits and designating family caretakers as essential workers. A startling new development tonight in Huawei CFO, CFO Meng Wanzhou's extradition case. The Wall Street Journal is reporting her lawyers are in discussions with the U.S. Department of Justice to resolve the criminal charges with a deferred prosecution agreement. Meng was arrested two years ago at YBR. Our Jason Proctor joins us live tonight. And Jason, when we uh, spoke to you a couple of nights ago, you said Meng's next uh, court appearance was going to be uh, in the spring, but it appears her legal team doesn't want to wait until then. Yeah, Mike, uh, this is startling news out of the U.S. Both the Wall Street Journal and the Reuters now apparently reporting these leaks out of the U.S. Department of Justice that suggest these talks are ongoing. They would see Meng uh, admit to some kind of wrongdoing in the case. Remember, she's charged with fraud uh, and conspiracy and allegations related to alleged violations of U.S. economic sanctions against Iran. Um, in terms of where the case is at right now, the proceedings are still ongoing in Canada, and I've reached out to her lawyers who have no comment with regards to this uh, today. But certainly uh, a lot going on with regards to this. Uh, you know, it could see her be able to return to China and the wrap up of these uh, of these uh, uh, allegations and, and the court process. Most importantly, from a Canadian perspective, you know, we've seen our relations with China deteriorate massively as a result of this. And we've seen two Canadians, Michael Spavor and Michael Kovrig, imprisoned in China since almost uh, the days after Meng was arrested. And so 
Who knows what this means for their family? There's been a lot of pressure on the Canadian government to come up with some kind of resolution to this. Reuters is saying that talks on this began just after uh, uh, the U.S. election. So uh, I know there's pressure on the Biden uh, uh, administration to uh, wrap this up, and we'll have to see where it goes. Should be a lot of interesting developments if, uh, in this in the days to come, Mike. Indeed, an intriguing development for certain. Jason, thanks very much. Jason Proctor reporting for us live tonight. Well, TransLink is now confirming a ransomware attack was the reason some of its services have been down over the past few days. The company had said it was investigating suspicious network activity. That activity meant that debit and credit card use at Fairgates and Compass vending machines was not possible since Tuesday. Our John Hernandez joins us now live in Burnaby with more on this. So, John, what's, what else is TransLink saying? Yeah, so I mean, the incident traces back to Tuesday, as you had mentioned, when Transic initially had said that uh, they had noticed suspicious activity within the IT system, but officials not being very forthcoming until today, just an hour ago, confirming that it was ransomware that had attacked the system. Now, ransomware is a malicious form of software that targets its victims by threatening to publish data unless they receive a ransom. And those threats had been making their way to uh, TransLink workers over the past number of days. In response, TransLink had shut down credit and debit uh, payments at both Fairgates and vending machines. Now, those have since been restored. However, there is an ongoing investigation by both transit police and uh, national cybercrime experts to determine exactly just how far this goes. And Transing is also uh, un unrolling its own forensic investigation to examine the full extent of the data breach here. Well, it is concerning, John. Uh, is Translink saying if any customer payment information might have been exposed? So, in a statement, Kevin Desmond, the, the Translink CEO, uh, was re reassuring to customers, essentially saying that most of the payments that are made, or in fact all of them made at the vending machines and at the fair gates here, uh, the payment information is actually processed through a third party, and that is uh, actually secured information. So, Translink doesn't in fact have access to that customer payment information. Uh, so therefore it would seem that uh, the ransomware, the attacker, wouldn't actually have access to that customer information as well. Uh, in a statement, uh, Desmond did say though, in light of the investiga investigation, uh, Transic did want to share this information with other organizations just to ensure that they understand some of the safety concerns surrounding ransomware attacks. Mike? All right, John Hernandez, live in Burnaby tonight. Thanks. A woman is dead after being shot while driving early this morning in Surrey. Officers were called to reports of a single vehicle crash in an alleyway in the 13700 block of 75A Avenue just after 5.30 a.m. When they arrived, they found a woman in the driver's seat with a fatal gunshot wound. No one else was in the car with the woman when she was found. Inside the vehicle, appears to be a woman uh, in her 30s. We know from the registered owner information of that vehicle that uh, the owner is a, is a woman in her late 20s. The priority right now for us is to determine who our victim is. Police believe a second vehicle was involved in this shooting. They are looking for evidence, including surveillance video. Investigators say it doesn't appear to be a random attack. RCMP and BC are reminding drivers officers will be out in full force this month. The annual counterattack campaign aims to keep impaired drivers off our roads. But road checks are going to be a little bit different this year. Just because COVID is upon us does not mean that our commitment to reducing the number of people needlessly killed on our roadways each year is diminished. We will still be out there conducting impaired driving enforcement. Officers will be wearing personal protective equipment and they'll maintain physical distance during stops, and they'll reduce contact with drivers and their documents. Drivers are being asked to take precautions as well, including putting on masks if they are pulled over. Impaired driving does remain one of the leading causes of death on BC roads every year. An average of 67 people are killed in collisions where alcohol, drugs, or prescription medications have been contributing factors. A growing need for emergency shelters and Christmas hampers has Union Gospel Mission answering the call once again tonight. 
The agency says it is seeing an alarming increase in the number of people asking for help. 22 new emergency shelter spaces will be added by next weekend, and 335 Christmas hampers going to families in need in the coming weeks. That's a 40% increase over last year. It varies by family, but it's extremely foundational for them um, because uh, people are right now worried about what they're going to do for the holidays, which is already a stressful time. And now with COVID-19, it's just people are stretched, stressed, and worried. UGM also handing out 200 carts filled with food and presents this month. Some seasonal joy for seniors, single people, and kids whose parents are struggling financially. Well, the troubles of Vancouver's downtown east side are well documented, a place of poverty and addiction. For many Indigenous peoples, it's a black hole that few ever escape from. But a new program is changing things. As Wamish Hamilton of our Urban Nations Unit tells us, a Heisler man's journey from near death to safety in his home community is a testament First Nations outreach on the front lines. Eight years ago, James Harry was an addict. He used to walk the streets and alleys looking for his next fix of crack cocaine. Today, he surveys them as an outreach worker looking for his own people who are where he used to be. Because I've been down here and I know exactly, I know exactly what they're going through, exactly what, what they're feeling. It was here that James found Dakota Auckland, a 22-year-old Heisler man originally from Kitimat. And coming from the doctor and the nurses that attended to him, that's basically on his last leg. James is also Heisler and his nation was the first to start looking for their own people on these city streets. The All Nation Outreach Program was formed to get their citizens off the street and into treatment. Lost their home, the help they need. I don't know that they're loved. I don't know that they, they matter. Only thing I was working towards, thinking of was using. Dakota is now 700 kilometers away from the downtown east side of Vancouver. He's living in a recovery home in Prince Rupert. He's going on eight months of being clean and sober. Today, he's far away from a possible death from tainted drugs or a medical infection. Just can't, I just can't believe that I'm here. This from my son reminds me that everybody is in a storm. Everybody needs an anchor. Lynn is Nishka. After a car accident that could have killed her, she saw an opening in this program and knew this is what she had to do. She felt the Creator saved her for a reason, and now she works to give back through the program. I believe I'm here because I have a very strong heart, I have a very strong mind, and I'm able to give the support that people need to hear and they need to see. The All Nation Outreach Program has grown from just the Heisla to the Squamish, Heltzuk, and Nishka nations. The hope is for more and more First Nations to join up. And they have your nation come looking for you. You know, I guarantee you there's no better feeling to these people down here. Look where I ended up. So it's not to be taken lightly. Way to go, Dakota, I'm proud of you. Keep moving forward. Remember, you deserve to heal. Eight months ago, James Harry told Dakota, you're not alone. There's another life waiting for you. Indigenous people on the downtown east side come from all across Canada. Many end up trapped in addiction. Hopefully, their people will come looking for them so that they too can start living the life that was waiting for Dakota. Wami Shamilton, CBC News, Vancouver. The Tsleil-Waututh Nation on the North Shore has unveiled the largest solar power project in Metro Vancouver. This is the pathway that we'd like to take, to not take more from the resources than we need, but to show that we can sustain our community. Construction on the project began in August and is now ready to harness the power of the sun. Total cost is about $600,000 with two-thirds of the funding coming from the nation itself. Taking advantage of the renewable energy will save the nation almost $30,000 a year. The Tsleil-Waututh hope the new project can be an example to other communities in BC of the benefits of solar power. 
On the other side of the water, across from the Tsleil Tooth Nation, our Joanna Wagstaff tonight. You know, the, the sun uh, did make an appearance this morning and then decided it didn't want to stick around for too long. Yeah, that's exactly what it did. It uh, just shifted eastward. I mean, the sun didn't actually, but uh, yeah, the clouds <laughs> moved in towards the afternoon hours. It's already beginning to break, though. It was uh, very much a little blip in our otherwise sunny forecast. Uh, let me start you off with the temperatures. They're actually going to be a little milder tonight with that extra cloud cover. Not by much, but this time yesterday we were down around a three, hanging on to a seven. It's amazing what uh, cloud cover can do, especially through the overnight. So we won't quite get down to the freezing mark. Uh, look for a cool start, but not quite the frosty and foggy start we'd be getting used to the past couple of mornings. So all of the weather, thanks to this very strong high pressure ridge that shifted eastward today, allowing that cloud to come in, but the shield held strong. So we're actually seeing a cloud break up as it sort of hits the dry wall in place across Metro Vancouver. That low though uh, is bringing a lot of rain to central coastal sections, high to Gwaii, 20 to 50 millimeters tonight. And that stream of moisture bringing big problems uh, to Alaska and Yukon as well. Taking you through our overnight again, the showers really not materializing across the strait. And I do think we'll see things clear up as we head into the uh, early morning hours. If you're up sort of 7, 8 a.m., it still might look a little cloudy, but by the afternoon hours, we'll be back to the sun. And I think I've got a few more days under the high pressure ridge. Full details coming up. All right. Thanks, Joe. Talking about and a reminder, you can also watch this newscast live on CBC Gem. CBC Vancouver, also on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. While BC's COVID-19 vaccine plan will be released next week, today the federal government said it is planning for the most ambitious rollout ever delivered in this country. Details on the timeline coming up. In December, an arrest was made that put Canada into the middle of a trade war between the United States and China. Ms. Mun, what do you have to say to the charges? Download Sanctioned today at cbc.ca slash sanctioned or wherever you get your podcasts. And thanks for sticking with us online during our commercial free live stream. While COVID-19 has unsettled a lot of people and ruffled a lot of feathers, that includes the feathers of Merlin the Macaw, a fixture at the Maritime Museum in Halifax. He missed the human interaction when COVID-19 restrictions took effect. Now he's getting international attention with his own web show. Colleen Jones has that story. Let me introduce you to the star of this story, Merlin the Rainbow Macaw, known as the Maritime Museum's talking parrot. Want a cracker? How about a banana chip? Richard McMichael has a degree in history. These days, he's known as the Parrot Whisperer. So when I started here in 83, I never had any inkling that at one point I'd be moderating a webcam for a Rainbow Macaw using the, you know, the user handle Parrot Whisperer. He calls his treats characters. Merlin's lived at the Maritime Museum since 2006, donated by a pet store. Cracker? Johanna Christensen, known as Ma to everyone at the museum, started being sort of Merlin's Ma. Oh. Oh. He said something to me one day that I had never said to him. And he came running across the top of the cage and said, love you. How, how can you not like him after that? That's why Johanna and Richard became alarmed in the spring over Merlin. When everything shut down because of COVID, Merlin was clearly missing his adoring fans, especially the kids. I was finding orange feathers everywhere. And he was clipping them, clipping them off out of anxiety of nobody being here. Ma probably told you that he went through extreme anxiety and stress because there weren't people around. Merlin's doing just fine now. All of his beautiful feathers have grown back. Still missing his in-person fan visits. He now, though, has a growing list of virtual fans, thanks to the weekly Squawk Talk series that Richard and Johanna take turns hosting. She's been doing sports and other related things for CBC over the years. Making them the country's only parrot whispers. Merlin, and by extension, I guess, uh, Ma and myself. And what's amazing about him is, as I say, this family of followers that he has and it's an international group I mean he has friends in Canada the states and then you know as far afield as England France Germany Finland Estonia now just like any television reporter 
he is very, very well aware of where his camera is. Let's oh, put it that yeah. way. Are you Ma's beautiful boy? Yes, you are. It's like he knew the word wings when he said wings. Mm -hmm. He is Ma's beautiful boy, and he can't wait for his fans to be able to return to the museum in person. Okay, Colleen that. Jones, CBC News, Halifax. Merlin, Merlin. Everybody needs a little social interaction, right? Okay, back uh, in just a couple of seconds, we're going to have the latest developments on COVID-19, the vaccine uh, that the federal government is planning to roll out. And we'll also look at the work India is doing to develop their own. We were looking forward to seeing you at our open house, but things are different this year. Last year, we raised more than a million dollars for local food banks across BC. We're not going to let 2020 stop us. It's great to see you. Especially at a time when the food banks need support the most. I'm so glad you asked. Join us online and on Radio 1 for CBC British Columbia's Food Bank Day on December 4th. As Canadians anxiously wait to learn exactly how and when they'll get the COVID-19 vaccine, the federal government says it's planning for the most ambitious rollout ever delivered in our country. CBC's Hannah Thibodeau now with details on the timeline. I feel privileged to join the team. To lead this is the man at the center of Canada's vaccine distribution. We're hard at it in the next couple of weeks to ensure that we are ready. And I, I kind of like the idea of uh, being ready before the Christmas uh, time frame. Former NATO commander in Iraq, Major General Danny Fortin is leading vaccination logistics and operations. Pfizer and Moderna vaccines are expected to be the first ones approved for use in Canada, but the initial vaccines will roll out differently. The Moderna vaccine will go to one central location and then sent to communities across the country. But the Pfizer vaccine, which is expected to be approved within days, needs to remain in sub-zero temperatures to remain viable. Fortin says locations across the country will get specialty freezers and will be ready by mid-December to receive the Pfizer vaccine. We identified the 14th of December as the date at which the initial 14 sites, um, you know, one per province, some provinces two, so 14 sites are ready in all respects to receive vaccines to, and to provide that to Canadians. Eventually, there will be 205 locations across the country where healthcare workers will administer all approved vaccines. And the team is preparing for any potential obstacles. The what if scenario. So what if we have, as I indicated earlier, bad weather in a country like Canada in winter? Uh, what does that do to, to, to remote and not so remote locations? What does, what does a, a cyber event uh, look like? What does that do to us? What does a physical security problem like a, a fire at a depot or a, a point of transfer or a, you know, is, is a location becomes compromised for whatever reason? While we are getting close to knowing the date, it's still unclear when Canadians will be able to roll up their sleeves to get their shot. Hannah Thibodeau, CBC News, Ottawa. Alberta is struggling in this pandemic by several metrics and some worry the worst is yet to come for the province. With Christmas holidays looming, there will almost certainly be family gatherings, and in the weeks after, another possible spike in cases for Alberta's beleaguered health care system to try to handle. Jenny Russell reports. This is a half-hashed uh, solution, which could have been prevented over a month ago with appropriate lockdown. A blunt assessment of an internal draft plan to build field hospitals similar to this. CBC News obtained a document dated November 28th showing the Alberta government has been planning field hospitals in Edmonton and Calgary for a total of 750 patients. Last week, as Premier Jason Kenney brought in new restrictions that many say do not go far enough, health officials toured three potential sites, all massive university sports facilities. The field hospitals would be inside, treating patients with mild to moderate symptoms. But staffing them is a concern, given the enormous strain on the province's hospitals and the increasing number of healthcare workers testing positive themselves. The plan suggests military help may be needed. Now, this is damage control right now. 
Uh, this is where you send people um, so that they're not seen to be dying in the streets. But the next step is refrigerator trucks. Yesterday, CBC News first reported that Alberta had asked the federal government for field hospitals. Kenny said it was responsible planning for an extreme scenario. But some infectious disease specialists say there must be evidence to warrant such a request. We're likely not to request a federal help or field hospitals if either the modeling didn't suggest we were going to get to that point or that the healthcare system wasn't already severely under strain. And from what we see in, in Alberta, it's likely a combination of both. Alberta's health minister dismissed criticism from the opposition that this signals a failure in pandemic response. Um, the, the NDP are again fear-mongering. We have currently right now surge capacity for 2,250 beds, well above of what's expected to be needed throughout the second wave. A report from the CBC's Jenny Russell in Edmonton tonight. Well, a week after Thanksgiving, the U.S. is seeing record daily highs. About 200,000 new cases and 2,800 deaths on Wednesday, the worst daily death toll of the pandemic. Hospitalizations are also soaring with more than 100,000 people needing care. And as Stephen D'Souza tells us tonight, that's pushing hospitals already stretched and healthcare workers to a breaking point. It was a picture that captured the pain and anguish on the front lines as a Houston doctor gave a moment's comfort amid so much uncertainty. He tells me, I wanna be with my wife. And man, when he said, I want to be with my wife, I just embrace him, I just hug him, and eventually he stopped crying. At United Memorial in Houston, three quarters of their beds are for COVID patients, a number that grows every day. My nurses cry in the middle of the day. They do so because, you know, they finish with one patient and then they have three more coming in. The United States is now seeing more patients in hospital with COVID-19 than at any other time in the pandemic. In Rhode Island, they've opened two field hospitals to boost capacity. In California, they expect hospitals to be at 112% capacity by Christmas. Where are the rest of the patients going to go? I mean, we're going to get into a situation like New York, like Italy did, like Spain did. Amidst this, the CDC changed its guidance on quarantines, telling people they can leave after 10 days with no symptoms, seven days if they get a negative test. The hope is a shorter time frame may actually get more people to comply. We're only as strong as the weakest link. And unfortunately, that, there are a lot of places in the United States which have been pretty weak. The looming fear now, the combination of Thanksgiving and Christmas travel and the impact it could have. Having worked more than 250 consecutive days battling the virus, Dr. Varon is blunt when asked about people traveling and taking part in large holiday gatherings. I would like to slap them because because of people like them, the next six weeks are going to be the darkest weeks in modern American medical history. He says, mask up, keep your distance, stay home. So the next embrace he gives isn't someone you know. Stephen D'Souza, CBC News, New York. And as countries around the world scramble to plan vaccine rollouts, a company in India is rushing to make and supply millions of doses. The global vaccine powerhouse opened its doors to CBC News. Salima Shivji has details, including India's challenges to distribute the vaccine. A crowded Delhi market, prime for the spread of infection. Only 100 rupees, only 100. The vendors mostly afraid of the virus, but needing to support their families. Sarojini says if the disease doesn't kill her, hunger certainly will. She's hoping a vaccine comes fast with so many dying. Steps away, Anil Kumar is trying to sell as many masks as possible. He's adamant any vaccine made in India should stay in India. And there are more than 50 million doses at the ready in the country, pallets of them kept in a cold storage freezer at the Serum Institute. Even before the pandemic hit, it was the world's largest vaccine maker. Those others now on the back burner. Our tour of the facility shows fermenting and purifying the COVID vaccine developed by the Oxford AstraZeneca team takes priority. That specific vaccine was a gamble the family-run company made early to mass produce long before approval to save time and lives with this.
There was so much uncertainty, we didn't know which vaccines would be safe. Absolutely no regrets from the billionaire CEO. Feeling quite good and relaxed now. At this stage, you know, it's been a very stressful time doing all this. And now we're on a sort of autopilot mode where we're just waiting for the results to come in. India already supplied more than half of the world's vaccines before the pandemic. It gives you the protection. From where the country was far behind was on PPE. But it didn't take long for many, like this garment factory owner, to pivot. From zero know-how in making all this to it making up nearly a quarter of the company's revenue. In our case, it was purely to stay alive. Had I not done it, I would probably have to shut my business. Producing gowns and vaccines, and so quickly. India is also planning on sharing its wealth with poorer countries, making sure they also get doses. Because of its vaccine capacity, India has that luxury. But there is a monumental task ahead at home, administering doses to 1.3 billion Indians in a country so vast. I'm very hopeful that by the end of next year, it should be something that would be easy for everyone to get. We've seen this happen. Hopes aside, experts see the challenge India is facing to dramatically ramp up its current vaccine program as daunting. But we want to deliver 500 million doses in a year. It would take about 27 years to do that at present staff capacity. A massive undertaking that many here are counting on with the number of infections closing in on the grim milestone of 10 million. Salima Shivji, CBC News, Delhi. Just ahead of our food bank day tomorrow, the demand on food banks in our region has never been greater. Coming up, we talk about the stigma of going to one and how that keeps some who need them away. When the Commodore Ballroom opened its doors, the words lover boy, cheap trick, boomtown rats, and the police held a totally different meaning than they do today. Today, they are names of rock bands who have played the Commodore. Back then, the police were people who might interrupt your evening. Structurally, the Commodore has changed very little over the years. The current owner, Drew Burns, plans to keep it that way. He's got a filing cabinet full of clippings written about his joint and a lot of anecdotes passed down. Saturday night was the dance night. Uh, and back in those days, of course, a bottle club. And when I took it over, I never have taken the button off. There was a button down at the very front door where the doorman was out there. And when the dry squad would arrive, he would press the button and it would light up on the stage. And for the regulars that came on a Saturday night, uh, they knew he'd play a certain tune. And they knew to take their bottles. And the, the, some of those old tables are still out there in the Commodore. And they had little shelves underneath. So you took your bottle off the table or on the floor, put it there. And of course, the the uh, tablecloth went right to the floor. And of course, the dry squad being quite you know, friendly about it, they'd hang around outside for five minutes till everybody got rid of everything, and then they'd come in and look around. Today, the Commodore isn't the dining and dancing place it once was. It makes money off bands, like tonight's headliner, Cheap Trick. But there are still people who say the Commodore is the best club in town, an intimate place, see good bands, and do some dancing. The dance floor is still springy, even after 56 years. Action speaks louder than words. That's the message of this new video just put together by Canadian rock artists. It speaks of the plight of the poor, especially of their hunger, and of the need to help. Bottom line is because I care about people that don't have enough to, uh, to eat, people that are locked into a self-perpetuating poverty situation, and uh, hopefully this will alleviate some of that and maybe spur some elected officials to change things around. The proceeds from the sales will go to food banks right across the country. The Vancouver Food Bank is trying to get enough food for one extra day of giving just before Christmas. These volunteers collected a whole van full of food. People are really willing to, to jump in and win this down. It's great. In October 82, the Vancouver Food Bank gave out 225 bags of food. In October 85, it gave out over 15,000 bags. All across the country, more and more people are, who never thought they would be poor are now living well below the poverty line. 
The boxes were slow to fill today, but the volunteers hope the record and video will have a ripple effect across the country and make many more people aware of poverty and hunger in Canada. Tortamel, CBC News, Vancouver. Some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News. And we're looking at the first week of January to be ready for that vaccine. Dr. Bonnie Henry spoke once again today about the promise of an approved vaccine arriving in BC within weeks. Two vaccines produced by Pfizer and Moderna are expected to be available to some people early in the new year. The provincial health officer will provide a detailed plan next week, but says priority will go to the most vulnerable British Columbians including residents of long-term care homes. Uh, these poor hockey players, both male and female, um, are on the sidelines once again. Disappointment from many in BC involved in adult team sports. They've been banned under a new provincial health order. Dr. Henry says when people come together in those situations, the virus can spread. And Dr. Henry is reporting 12 more deaths and 694 new cases of COVID-19 in BC. The number of active cases across the province has risen to more than 9,100, but the number of patients in hospital has dipped slightly to 325, with 80 in critical condition. CBC British Columbia's Food Bank Day is going to look a bit different this year, but it's still in support of an important cause, local food banks across BC. Join us online and on Radio 1, December 4th. And yes, indeed, tomorrow is CBC Vancouver's Food Bank Day. It's our annual fundraiser to support those in need in our community. And this year, it feels more necessary than ever. Many people have fallen on hard times because of the pandemic, and they're turning to their local food bank for help. Yeah, they sure are. But as CBC's Joel Ballard discovered, the stigma surrounding food banks is still a barrier for some. What kind of meat do you have? Andrew Spence never takes more than he needs. What is that? It is a scarf and a tooth. No, save that for somebody who needs it. Okay. He's been coming to the Richmond Food Bank for the last three years. Have a good day. But weekly visits were never part of his plan. For most of my life, I've never even uh, thought about it. I just wasn't, didn't need it, and it was for, meant for people that did, did need it. An aircraft maintenance engineer by trade, Spence lost his job. Things started to spiral. Soon, he was sleeping in his car. Eventually, he got into social housing. And despite feeling a bit of stigma around food banks, he needed to eat. Uh, the hunger outweighed the, uh, the harshness of my reality. Now, a condition in his hand keeps him from finding new work in his fields. Uh, I, I'm not really ashamed, but... I don't openly say, oh, yeah, I go to the food bank every week and it's all free and da, da 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 and this or that. I come here because I need to. Today's catch? A real nice uh, dragon fruit. Looks kind of strange, but very tasty. Nice fresh zucchini. A uh, couple of real nice pieces of fish. So I'll be able to cut this up and there's at least four meals there. Inside, a team of staff and volunteers keep the warehouse running. From sorting to checking expiration dates to organizing, there's plenty to do, especially with client numbers up since COVID-19. Across the board, more people, more individuals, more households, um, more younger families. People who have lost their jobs due to the pandemic. And when CERB ended, the numbers jumped again. Whatever is happening in our economy kind of reflects in, uh, in the lineups here. Hussein calls her workplace a community from the staff to the clients. People think that food bank is only for the homeless or you know who don't have any income. But that's not true. Food bank we like we provide food to people like us because anybody can can hit hard times. Back outside, Spence knows how powerful a detraction stigma can be. Just like the first time we rode rode a bike or the first time we drove a car 
you, you know, the first time can be scary. But if you just get over the fear and, and the stigmatism that you think is there, then it, 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 won't, it won't be an issue. Joel Ballard, CBC News, Richmond. Okay, Joe, so CBC Open House Food Bank Day tomorrow. The house, mm -hmm. the house is open virtu yes. virtually. Exactly. My house be, is open. And your house is open. <laughs> it's a little different this year. So uh, what are you going to be doing? Well, Mike, uh, 11 a.m., I will be giving a virtual weather lesson. So uh, cool. you can still sign up online. Uh, there won't be any pop quiz. And I'm looking forward to chatting virtually uh, with many of you out there. And, and yeah, nice reminder from Spence uh, what this is all about, right? What, yeah. uh, what, what's your uh, day looking uh, like, I'm going to be coming on with our colleague from the National, Ian Hanamansing, uh, right after Ooh. you at noon. We're going to be looking back uh, at some of the big uh, news stories, uh, both nationally and provincially over the past year. There have been a few. Uh, uh, just a few. Just, just a few, yeah. So that's uh, that's coming up at... Uh, okay, I'm the warm-up yeah. act. There, I got this. <laughs> get them warmed up. All right, yeah. so thanks. You'll be back in just a sec with the forecast Sounds and good. some weather art. Stay right here. I never used to be very fond of you know, Christmas decorations, but this year they have a meaning. They bring joy and light. We need that. <laughs> and uh, once you put the lights on, it definitely makes a big difference in the house. It's been, it's been incredible. We've, uh, we had to stop our sales uh, 10 days ago because uh, we were selling a thousand tree a day on our website. We increased our sale by 50%, but we could have gone as much as, uh, well, double our sales this year, but we don't have enough trees, you know? I cannot manufacture those trees, so there's, there's a shortage of tree uh, in our case. This year's it's really, really good. <laughs> we have sale uh, a lot of, of tree. We have uh, almost half of our tree already sale before the first of December. The COVID is one cause because uh, more people are at home this year. Uh, nobody will traveling, uh, and also uh, we have more exportation to USA, so less tree available for Quebec, even if tree grow in Quebec and more, most of them will uh, uh, is export to USA uh, definitely uh, earlier than other years almost the week after Halloween we were all already receiving calls when when can we get our Christmas tree? So wholesalers, since uh, they're selling their stock very early, they might uh, see a uh, few less trees available uh, during the, the end of the season. But the Choose and Cut have a big inventory for uh, uh, all Quebecers in the area. Here in Estrie, we produce trees uh, for uh, not only Quebec, but uh, a big portion of the North American uh, market. like that Christmas decoration and just the smell of a real tree it just brings like so much warmth to uh, to a home to a house and I feel like this year it's really important to remind each other that um, although we're going through a really tough reality right now it's important to like keep you know to stay happy and stay healthy and that's what's the most important The Market Report is brought to you by Fortis BC. 
We've got even bigger rebates. Rebates. Whoa. On select high-efficiency equipment for business, but only for a limited time. Johanna Wagstaff back now with the uh, the forecast. Did we totally escape the uh, the showers? I know we still got a few hours left in the day, but uh, I think we totally escaped well, the showers. Great. I know. There you go. Brilliant. That's a Thursday for you. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> uh, we do have a couple of dry days ahead before we get back in the showers, but yeah, I think we did it. High pressure uh, managed to keep the atmosphere dry enough that they sort of dissipated before they got to us. I did see a few east of Coquitlam in the last hour, but for most of Metro Vancouver, pretty dry. Take a look at the temperatures across the province. It's actually cooler in through southern and eastern sections than it is for central and northern BC, and that's because our high pressure is directing the heat sort of up and over. I'll talk more about that in a moment. We do have a very wet forecast for central and northern coastal sections to talk about as that little high stays uh, nice and dry, tucked into the uh, east southeast corner of the province. It's directing all of those lows up towards the north. So a very wet forecast for Haida Gwaii northward. Uh, and this is bringing some flooding uh, problems to Canada, uh, to the Yukon, as well as Alaska. Just a stream of moisture uh, hitting north of us. Well, we sit under that high pressure system. Uh, two and through Williams Lake tomorrow with three for Kamloops. Uh, cooler temperatures in the morning. We're talking a minus one uh, through the overnight for Kelowna, more like a minus five in through Cranbrook. And then nine with steady rain in through Prince Rupert. Take a look at these temperatures up north uh, over the next couple of days. These are all a good five to 10 degrees above seasonal. Uh, Dawson Creek at a six normally would be uh, at the freezing mark for this time of year. And then uh, a little cooler down uh, across the south i think this uh, model is overdoing our temperatures in vancouver i think we'll be lucky to hit sort of eight to nines in the next couple of days a 10 not out of the question but uh through the central interior and southern interior definitely more seasonal uh, if not below because of those very cold overnights letting heat radiate away so we'll continue our dry stretch through friday some cloud to start getting the sun back for the afternoon temperatures drop again friday night and saturday night Sunday looks like the clouds roll in for the afternoon, so not a bad start to your Sunday either. It's Monday that we look for that big uh, change in the weather pattern. It looks pretty soggy to start next week. Not a bad run until then. Yeah, it looks great. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, I think it's fair to say that if there's one thing we can rely on, and you remind us of this most nights, it's that the weather is always changing. Don't I know it, Mike. Uh, but I got to speak to one local artist who found a way to silence the swirling systems above one stitch at a time. There were mare's tails in the sky and cat's paws on the water. Shafshin, my mother called the woolly lamb-like herds of altocumulus. Vancouver artist Bettina Matskun first became fascinated with weather while sailing with her father on weekends here in British Columbia. I looked at weather maps at different websites and just mined it for the imagery that you would look at every day. Her series, Weathering, explores the maps and symbolic systems of meteorology. Now that is some art I can get behind. So the pieces are uh, painted, embroidered, um, have things sewn on them. There's, I cut up my old Gore-Tex jacket to make arrows. Uh, there's like bootlace cord, but mostly it's, it's embroidered. Then she learned about map projections. That is the different ways to flatten a globe's surface into a plane in order to make a map, and potentially my secret obsession. One of these is the Waterman butterfly projection that aims to display the world without distorting the shapes of its continents. And the map is shaped like a butterfly. And when I saw the Waterman butterfly, it was just uh, like a light bulb went off. I think it's part of an artist's job to make connections between disparate things. The German word for butterfly is Schmetterling, which also means fragile. The idea of the atmosphere conflated with something that's very fragile that you could hold in your hand and crush, you know, is to me kind of um, sobering. And indeed, her work is a reminder of the delicate balance of our atmosphere and climate change. However, Matskun says that's not the top question she gets asked about her work. 
it's the how long does it take you question because I think to a lot of people they just couldn't imagine spending that amount of time on something but like nobody questions you when you watch reruns of Seinfeld or stuff you know it, so it's time to me is just an ingredient like you know baking soda and probably a few weeks for each one of those butterflies is the answer and in that time the weather has probably swirled on west to east circling back around the globe perhaps with the help of a flap of a butterfly wing it goes well beyond the typical christmas decoration the message behind the gratitude tree next Back in early 60s, Rick's father was the first one to cut my hair. I was only a small boy, I'd say, because we lived on Brazil Square and it was just around the corner. I'm going there my whole life and enjoyed it, and I know it's going to happen to my hair after he moves. <laughs> I'm going to have long hair. <laughs> well, I started with a Gulliver, I'll end with a Gulliver. <laughs> <laughs> I always said that when the time came, I'd know. And I'm starting to feel a bit tired, a bit weary of it all. So it's time to, I hear it's time to go. I still got a bit of health and strength and enjoy a bit of life anyway. I'm not going to be around until I'm 96 like my dad was. So I better do it now. And he was 18 when he started. So I don't, well, maybe it is meant to be that way. It's just I was 18 when I really started. <laughs> Don't know what I'm going to do with my time, but I guess I'll find something. Be good to people, and they'll come back. That's the big thing to it. Mm -hmm. And they'll always remember you for it. And you know, you're not going to please everybody, but uh, just remember one thing, those you don't please, do the best you can for them. Well, it's around this time of the year you'll start to notice holiday decorations appearing outside people's homes, my windows included, all sorts of dazzling lights uh, for onlookers. Yes, but a Christmas tree in Oak Bay on the island is getting attention for its deeper meaning. Take a look. 
This is a gratitude tree. With 2020 and uh, with uh, COVID-19 and restrictions that are in place, uh, we're all feeling the pinch, whether it's uh, through work or uh, family or losing people. And I thought if I could put some positive messages out there daily for the next 25 days in hopes that it would bring a smile to someone's face for at least those 25 days, even one person a day, then that is my little part that I can do to help spread some joy. The first one that I wanted to be on here was compliment a stranger. And December 2nd, uh, we have phone, text, or write someone that you haven't talked to in a while. I'm really trying to do things that on here that aren't going to uh, cost people money, but just a little bit of time, maybe a little bit of effort, and maybe a little bit of kindness. The reaction's been overwhelming. Uh, it wasn't what I expected uh, when I posted it. I would love to see these trees all over Victoria, uh, all over the island, all over BC, and right across Canada. That's wonderful. Never seen anything like that, that before. No, me neither. And it's it's the theme this season, isn't it? Just yeah. to uh, be kind, extra yeah. acts. Show some gratitude, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, we hope you can uh, show some gratitude uh, yes. tomorrow. It's our annual Food Bank Day. Uh, Johanna's going to be participating virtually uh, along with uh, other hosts here. So we hope you can uh, join us uh, tomorrow and be sure to uh, to donate. It's going to feel like a great day. It'll uh, it'll be different, but it's going to be a good one. Absolutely. All right, that's it for us tonight. Uh, Dan Burrett is here at... 11 o'clock right after the National. Have a great evening. See you tomorrow.